I want to read today from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and um, starting with verse 24. And uh, let me give you the context before I read this. Matthew 16, 24 is where I'm going to start. Uh, what's happened right before this is uh, Jesus was sitting around with his disciples and he said to them, Who do men say that I am? And they all had some suggestions. Some say you're this one, some say you're that one. And uh, then Peter spoke up and said, You are the Christ, um, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was pleased with that answer from Peter. And he said uh, to Peter, and he said, You are, of course, he was, his real name is Simon. And Jesus gave him the name Peter. And he said, On this rock I'll build my church. And he really praised him and, uh, because he gave that answer. Uh, and then he began to warn them not to go and tell that right then and there. And he also began to warn them that they were going to Jerusalem and that the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders were going to treat him badly and that he would be killed and rise again on the third day. And then Peter, I guess, you know, with his new status as, you know, kind of a, a leader, I guess, he took Jesus aside privately and he said, no, Jesus, not so, uh, uh, you know, pity yourself. That's what it literally says that they told him, um, this is not going to happen to you. We're not going to let this happen. And then Jesus turned to Peter, this one that he just got through praising a moment ago, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> he said to Peter, he says, because you do not value the things of God, but the things that are of men. In other words, you're, you're looking at it from a human point of view. To say it yet another way, uh, this, what I just said to you about the fact that I'm going to be killed and then rise again the third day, though that sounded uh, like a bad thing to Peter, he couldn't understand because he was looking at it from a human perspective that this was God's plan. This is what God intended for salvation. Of course, we look back at it now as Christians, we can understand it, but Peter didn't, you know, it didn't compute. It didn't make sense to him. And uh, immediately after that, Jesus said this in verse 24. He says to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, by the way, the word translated soul here is the same word used for life. It's, it just means your personal, uh, your life is really what he's saying there. Uh, so what does he mean back in verse 24 when he says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, when I read those kind of things, let's just be honest about it. It sounds kind of hard, sounds kind of scary, sounds kind of tough. Here's my question for you. Does Jesus, well, first of all, did he mean this literally? Uh, no, I don't think so. You know, sometimes people go to a, such a strange extreme. And, you know, I, I have this in the back of my Bible. I carry this little news clipping around with me about this man. Um, in fact, I have it right here that, that took that literally. And he, uh, he, he literally tried to uh, nail himself to a cross. And you've probably heard me read this before. And this is a real news story. Uh, it said a Heartland man was treated at a Pittsfield hospital after he nailed himself to a cross. The 23-year-old man was apparently trying to commit suicide Thursday evening in his living room. Uh, the Somerset County Sheriff Barry DeLong said Monday no charges will be filed. There's no crime here. Uh, he, he appeared delusional and told them he has been seeing pictures of God on the computer. And he had just seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, which depicted the crucifixion of Jesus. Anyway, the, it says here that he took two pieces of wood and nailed them together in the form of a cross, placed them on the floor, and then he uh, proceeded to nail one of his hands with a 14-penny nail and a hammer to the cross. And here's the quote. Now, I read all that to say this. The police lieutenant said, When he realized he was unable to nail his other hand to the board, he called 911. And see, you know, it's, it's sad and funny at the same time, but here's the point. He took it literally. He took what Jesus said literally, and he literally was trying to, in a sense, take up his cross and imitate Jesus and follow his example. But he found out that he couldn't do it. He found it, it can't be done. 
you can't crucify yourself, even if you take it literally. Because if you get one hand nailed down, how are you going to deal with that other one? You see, that's the problem with it. Now, here's a question for you. Is Jesus, does he really mean whatever he's talking about in these verses, however you take it, however you understand it, does he really mean that this is something that he intends for us to do? Because if he does, let's just be honest, it's going to be done in a half-baked, imperfect, incomplete way. Is it okay if I'm that honest? <laughs> in other words, if he intends for this, for us to do as it's, if you just read it casually and don't read anything else in the Bible, if you just take that and just put blinders on and don't think about it, if he means for us to do it, let's just admit that it's not going to really get done, number one. And number two, what does get done will be half-baked and imperfect. Um, Charlie and I know about Promise Keepers. Remember we used to go to those Promise Keepers meetings? It was a good thing. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the socializing with the men. Didn't you enjoy it? Yeah. Talking to those guys. Christian men from different denominations all get together and trade misconceptions with one another. <laughs> it's kind of what, what it seemed like sometimes. Uh, but, you know, um, and, and what I'm about to say, I don't mean this, uh, I don't mean to as a criticism of any of the men. I liked everybody. I liked them all. But I, I realized that when men sit down and start talking about religion, what, really, what you're really hearing is a reflection of what they've been taught in most cases, you know. And, and so uh, I remember uh, at, at one of these meetings, uh, uh, this one particular man, I liked, liked him, nice man. But I came in and I was just said in a kind of cheerful way, how are you doing today, brother, or something like that. How are you? And he, he replied with a kind of a moan. He said, oh, kind of like that. Oh, he, and he scrunched his face up in pain, sort of. He said, oh, it's hard, he said. It's hard, he said. And see, now, again, I'm not criticizing him. I'm not making fun of him. I'm telling you, he's telling me what, he's about to, what I'm about to say here, what he'd been taught in church. Anyway, he said, it's hard to crucify this old flesh. And uh, I thought to myself, yeah, it's hard. Uh, it's so hard that maybe it's too hard for you, you know. And here's the thing. He's saying, evidently, there's something going on, you know, or I don't know what he was exactly referring to. But it was obvious from what he was talking about. Whatever it was, it hadn't gotten done. He felt like crucifying the flesh was something he was supposed to do. But it obviously was not done. It was incomplete. Now, if Jesus is here uh, telling us through the disciples that you've got to try to do this, it's, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to be incomplete. It's never going to quite get done. Well, I think, you know, that we should think about this a little uh, more deeply. And I don't think that Christianity is, is meant to be something imperfect and half-baked and not done. Um, because Jesus, for one thing, on the cross, he said it is finished. So there's something finished about it, at least. Now, let's look at another passage that bears on this. And, uh, and, and, we're gonna, and I'll come back to this in a minute, this idea. But look at Galatians chapter 5 with me for just a moment. And uh, here's something Paul wrote. It says here, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Now this comes right after um, Jesus uh, listing what he called the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And in verse 24, in Galatians 5, 24, he said, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Um, I just want to call to your attention that he does not say they that are Christ should crucify the flesh. Let me double check. He doesn't say they ought to. He doesn't say it's a noble goal for them. A yeah, preoccupation with them, they should try to. He doesn't say try to. He doesn't say attempt to. He doesn't say you should. He says they that are Christ have. Am I right? I'm just asking you about the words here. 
to me, when I say have, that sounds like something that's already been done, doesn't it? Well, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't remember when I did it. <laughs> that's because you didn't do it. Now, just stay with me now. Don't, I, want to, I want to give you Paul's perspective. See, this is why it's important to read what you read in the Gospels in the light of what Paul has to say about it. Because let me, let me just say it this way. When Jesus was talking to his disciples back there, and he had that little exchange with Peter, and he told them, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and be killed, and Peter said, no, you're not. And see, he said, you don't understand things from God's point of view. You're looking at it from man's point of view. You know, the whole idea of redemption through the death of Jesus on the cross was a mystery. You know, Paul said that if the princes of this world would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It was hidden at that time. Before it happened, it was a mystery. Before it happened, it was hidden. You know, the, almost the last thing Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, it's in John's Gospel, just before he went to the cross, he said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the Spirit of Truth has come, he will lead you into all these. There were some things that, that they didn't know yet. And so, the way he said things in the Gospels uh, was sort of clouding the issue. He spoke in parables many times. He didn't show the complete uh, reality of redemption, although when, after the fact, it's all revealed. Um, Paul said, these things eye has not seen and ear has not heard what the Lord has prepared for them that love him, but they have been revealed to us by his Spirit. And Paul is giving us a point of view uh, that shows this work in a completed way. Now, let me show you something else that Paul said. This is in, uh, well, if you take Hebrews as, as Paul's writing, uh, Hebrews chapter, um, what do I want here? Chapter 2, verse 9. Let me just call this to your attention. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. It starts this way. But we see Jesus. That's always good. You know, that's always a good perspective. We should keep Jesus in the mix. It's not a do-it-yourself religion we have here. We see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Now listen to this last part. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man or every person. It just means everyone. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, whatever he was talking about back in the Gospels had to do with a cross, had to do with the language of death and losing your life and so forth uh, and finding it. Here it says that Jesus, by the grace of God, did it for every man. Taste death for every man. His death in what he did was something that was for you. It was for everyone. He did it for you, in other words. It was done on your behalf. And you see, this is uh, Paul's perspective on the whole matter. Look at uh, Romans chapter 6 just for a second. I just want you to notice the language of the Apostle Paul here. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. He says, um, he's been talking about uh, baptism being a symbol of the fact that, well, let's just back up and get it. Uh, in verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? We didn't do our own. We're baptized into His. Therefore, in other words, for this reason, we are buried with Him by baptism into death. In other words, baptism is like a symbol. The fact that we are viewing ourselves as entering into His death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For, verse 5 says, if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, now, he doesn't mean here the baptism itself. The baptism is just a symbol. 
He's saying if we were participants in his death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. In other words, if we are participants in his death, we also are participants in his resurrection. And if he is raised from the dead in new life, we should view it that we as participants by our faith in him are walking and living in new life. And here's verse 6, knowing this. Now, when I see the Apostle Paul say knowing this, what it tells me is this is something he wants the reader to know. This is something he wants us to factor into our thinking. Knowing this, that our old man, look, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, you get what he's saying? He's saying that we should factor into our thinking. He wants us to know this that our old self, that is to say our before Christ self, uh, the flesh self, uh, is crucified with him. The one who tasted death for every man. The one who did it on your behalf. So that the body of sin would be destroyed. Now don't get nervous there. Uh, to me, uh, uh, well let me just say this. The word destroyed doesn't mean obliterated and cease to exist. It mean, it's, a, it's a Greek word, and I think these Greek words are interesting. They're sometimes compound words where they take two separate words that say something different and they smoosh them together. The word that's translated destroyed there is a Greek word, katargeo. It means to uh, deprive of power, to be rendered powerless, to take away its power. It would be like if you had an electrical appliance and you pull the plug out of the wall, you've deprived it of power. That's what catargeo means. The plug's been pulled. It can't operate. It doesn't have any power. Paul is here saying that by knowing, by factoring into your thinking, that our old self, that is the flesh, you know, the part that, oh, it's hard to crucify the old flesh. Yeah, it is if you're trying to do it. But you see, Paul didn't tell you to do it really. He said, knowing this, that our old self is crucified with him. By knowing that, the body of sin or the uh, actions of the flesh are deprived of power. That henceforth we should not serve sin. That's the better goal. A perfect death that got the job done that we are participants in. Now just hang on, don't, don't check out yet. Um, now go back to Galatians and look at what Paul said. This is the more famous verse. Look at the way he says this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is how Paul says it regarding himself. Now this is the King James translation that we have here. And it's a big long verse here, but we're just going to deal with the first part. He says, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is uh, the King James translation. You know, on the computer, the computers are marvelous. You know what I used to have to do before computers? I used to have, I've got all these Bible translations back there. I've got maybe 20 different ones, 20, 25. And I collected those over the years. Some of them used to belong to my father. Some of them I bought. Some I got from Merlin Booty. I got so many, and some of them, there's like six in one book. And you know what I used to do if I was studying a verse like this? I'd have to get all those books out and lay them all out on the table. And the print's real small. I'd have to look at it real careful. And look it all up in all those different books. And I used to do that. And then look it up in a strong concordance. Open that big old thing up. And the print is the size of little ant footprints. And tiny little, th I have to use a magnifying glass and look up all the words. You know what I can do now? I can get online and I can go to an online Bible and read it in the King James translation. And there's a little button there that says, would you like to read this verse in all other English translations? <laughs> so I click on that and I just sit there and read it all. And, and I did that with this verse. And I, let me tell you something. This Galatians 2.20, where the King James says, I am crucified with Christ, almost, except for the ones that are offshoots of the King James that just repeat this, Almost every other translation says one of two things. 
I have been or I was. I have been or I was. One of them, for example, I just pulled this one out of the mix, the Expanded Bible. I don't really know much about that one. It says, listen to this now. I was put to death on the cross with Christ. Now, is that blunt enough? I was put to death on the cross with Christ. Um, you know, when Jesus said to those disciples, what it means to follow me is that you're going to have to take up a cross. Now, he said, take up your cross and follow me. And if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. What I believe he was saying in masked parable type language was, there's a cross involved and you've got to take it up. But really what he meant was, uh, it's going to be my cross. The cross that we take up is the cross of Christ. By Paul here saying this, this is a way of like saying, his cross is my cross and I take it up gladly. See, you notice Paul's language here? It sounds just like Jesus. He said, I am crucified with Christ. I, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Jesus said, you'll have to lose your life to find it. This is the same thing. This is the same truth here. Uh, in case you're thinking, yeah, but Jesus plainly said, you've got to do this. Well, let me ask you this by way of answer. Did God tell Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac up on that mountain. Have you ever read that story? He told him to. He said, you know what, Abraham? Go and sacrifice Isaac on that mountain over there. So Abraham headed up to that mountain. But do you know in the end, God gave the sacrifice. God provided the sacrifice. What he first told Abraham, in other words, this is God's method of operation. He first shows what has to be done and lets you consider it for a while, and maybe even uh, find out for yourself that it's impossible for you to do it. <laughs> you know, those passages I read in the beginning from Jesus, if anybody's honest, if we're honest, this is the big problem we have. We, we should just be honest. You should just read and say, this sounds too hard for me. <laughs> we hate to do that, you know. We like to obfuscate and say, well, I'll try harder. You know, I'll try later. But you know what? All that trying harder, trying harder, it never gets it done. It never gets done. If you think you're going to do it, and I'm sorry, to, you know, I hope I'm not bursting anybody's bubble, but it's just not going to get done. Like that guy I read you the news story about. You can get one hand nailed down, but the other one's still out here going crazy. <laughs> you follow me? But I'll tell you, there is a death that was complete. And there was a death on your behalf where Jesus tasted death forever, where he did it for you. And what Paul is here saying is, embrace that and say, uh, I have been, or I was. That's right. And so, if that's true, then it's not really me anymore living. It's Christ that lives in me. That's how we should view it. Walk in newness of life is the way Paul said it. Um, let me read you what the message says. Torin, could you back up to verse 19? I want to get a run at it. And this is what the message says, starting with verse 19. I love this. This is so clear and good. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping the rules, working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. See, this is what I like about the message. He's, he's just honest enough to tell it like it is. Let me read you that again, in case you didn't get it. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping the rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. <laughs> I like to just let that resonate. <laughs> it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. And now the next verse is what we were just reading. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not, quote, mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that a good thought? Yes. Now, let's talk about the practical side of this. You know why that idea that I've got to do it 
I've got to crucify the old flesh. And you know, why that resonates with us is, and again, I, I just think we should just be honest about things. It resonates with us because we look at our lives from a human point of view, you know, almost like when Jesus said to Peter, you're looking at it like man instead of like God. We'd be better off if we looked at it like God, like from this point of view. But we look at our lives and we see things that need to be dealt with. Let's just be honest about it. There's the flesh. There's this verse talks about ego. We see those things pop up from now, now and again. And we think to ourselves, I got to take care of that. I got to work on that. But do you? Or is this about Christ and his work? Let me read you another verse here. This is in Philippians chapter 1, Torrin, if you give me this. And I'm going to go back to the King James for this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. This is such a great verse. This is, this is one that's worth underlining, <laughs> if you like to underline your Bible. Now, if you ask me, uh, my Bible's almost all under, you know, oh, not really. But there's a lot of underlining. And in fact, it occurred to me one day as I got my pen out and I'm underlining something. I said, what am I going to do when I get them all underlined? <laughs> I have to get a new Bible to start over, I guess. Anyway, but that's a good thing, you know, because I read something and think, man, I've got to remember where this is. I want to come back. This one you want to come back to again. Philippians 1, 6. Paul's writing, of course, to the church in a place called Philippi, uh, the Philippians. And listen to what he said. This is so encouraging, I think. Being confident. And by the way, I like the word confident. You see, I think, I think that uh, in our Christian lives, that's one of the most important things we should derive from reading the Bible and from going to church and from our Christian activities. It should be creating in us a sense of confidence. And here Paul says, being confident. And what is it, by the way, that he wants us to be confident of? Being confident of this very thing. By the way, he's writing to Christians, right? He's writing to Christians in Philippi. The Philippians. We are Christians in Alva or wherever you're from. If you're watching it on the video, wherever you live, we are reading over the shoulders of those fellow Christians and we're just like them. There's no difference between us and those people to whom Paul is writing. If he were around today and he knew us, he would write these same things to us. There's no difference. So this is perfectly applicable to us. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, who is he that began a good work in you? Well, it's Jesus or God. I mean, they're working together on us. And the Holy Spirit, they're all on the same team here, however you want. It's, in other words, it's not you, it's him. He has begun a good work in you. Now, this implies to me that, uh, that, he's, uh, that there's an ongoing work uh, so when we see things um, in our everyday lives that we say to ourselves, you know, that needs attention. What we should remind ourselves is, well, the same one who came into my life and began in my heart to work, he knows about it just as much as I do. He knows where work needs to be done. Now, this word um, perform attracted my attention. And I looked it up um, Again, using the computer where it's really convenient. You used to look it up in a big fat book, and I've got that big fat book in the office if anybody wants to borrow it. <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's much easier. Just go online, and you can punch a button, and you can, you can read what all these different uh, authorities in the Greek language have to say about it, and all the different aspects of what the words mean. I looked this word perform up. In the Greek language, it is um, epitelio. Um, teleo means something like the end or the completion. And here's literally what this word epitelio means. And I'm just now going to quote from what I read from the description from Strong's Concordance. This word where it says, that he which began a good work in you will epitelio. Here's what it says, and I'm now quoting, to bring to an end. Remember, this is talking about something that he, it says, he that began will do this. To bring to an end, to accomplish, to perfect, to execute, to complete. Now listen to this. I like this one. I highlighted this one. To take upon oneself, to make an end for oneself. It's saying that the same one who began to work in your life has 
taken on the task for himself. He will make an end and accomplish it himself. If you look at your life and you say, I'm not perfect yet, that's okay. He knows that. He has taken it on as his project. And he will bring it to completion. This is what Paul is saying. This should give you confidence that he, you know. See, I think sometimes it's hard to get away from this idea that he's sitting up in heaven like a judge and looking at us and tapping his fingers on the table like, you know, like that. No, he looks at us in love and he comes into our lives in love and he knows what needs help and he knows what needs attention and he knows all about the flesh. Did you know that Paul says that he came into this world in a body of flesh? He said in the likeness, Paul even says in the likeness of sinful flesh. He knows what it's like to be in a human body. He knows what it's like to deal with all the frustrations and, and issues and problems and all the different things that, uh, that make up the human experience. He knows. He knows what it's like. And he is sympathetic. We're told that he has sympathy with us, that he is sympathetic to our, our struggles and our, our problems. But he comes into our lives to take on the task for himself, to take on the project for himself. Uh, and Paul here says, be confident of this, that he which began the good work, he'll bring it to completion. He didn't say, he started, then you take over. He said, no, the same one that starts, he will complete it. Now, you know what I like about this, seeing it from this point of view? Uh, this harmonizes with something Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. And Torn, would you give me that from the King James translation? This is a familiar verse. I read it all the time, quote it all the time. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, and when it, you see it, you'll remember it's so familiar. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then the next verse says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Take one more here. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. A yoke is what hooks two things together, two animals, you know, you might say. Uh, two oxen, you know, or two animals are hooked together. He, he's saying, you know, we're hooked together with him. It's a metaphor for our relationship with him. And he's saying that this relationship with him will give you rest. That's what he said. Come to me, take my yoke, get hooked up with me, and you'll find rest for your souls. You know why that is? Not, not, he didn't say disruption and frustration and disturbance and, and never getting it done and, you know, and this anxiety and aggravation for your souls. He said rest for your souls. You know why? Because once we're hooked up with him, he's got the power to get the job done. He knows how to do it. He knows how to walk the Christian walk. Don't you think he knows how to live a Christian life? <laughs> he's Christ. <laughs> we're the ones that uh, are uncertain about it. But, you know, what he's actually here saying is, just, just hook up with me and, and walk along with me. Let me work. We walk and he works. I love what the message says. And, in fact, that's why the message says it. Could you go back, Torn, to uh, verse 28? And I haven't read this for a while in the message, but let me read it today. Because I think this is a good thought to leave you with. Are you tired and worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me and get away. Uh, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. You know, this... This reminds me of what we just read a while ago. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. See, we come to him and we become participants in a death that's already done. We could say like Paul, you know what? His cross was my cross. I was crucified with him. I no longer live. He lives in me. He says, this is how you recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. I like the fact that he describes this Christian life in terms of, for us, rest. It's the rest of confident trust in Him. That's what the rest is. Okay, the next verse, Torn. Walk with me. Isn't that a nice thought? Walk with me. That just means, you know, walk is a metaphor, right? I mean, you can think of it as literally walking. It's, it's a pretty picture. It's a, it's a metaphor for us. It's like in your everyday life, uh, you're walking along with Him. You should kind of picture it that way. He's walking along with you in your life. He's there to help. He's there to, you know... To deal with things. He's there to help you. He's there to be 
uh, your you know, assist if you need assistance. He's there to lead. He's there to guide. He says, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. You know, he knows how to do things. He knows how to deal with people that you do. <laughs> you know, sometimes when I'm talking to somebody, I think to myself, you know, if Jesus were here, how would he want to answer this person? <laughs> well, you know, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That tells me that it's not meant to be artificial or phony or a put on. It's not fake. It's unforced. It's the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. And then the last one. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Now what I think is, if we could adopt this, if we, if we could really experience this, I think this creates a very attractive kind of life. Instead of coming to people who aren't Christians and saying, you ought to do this, and you ought to do that, and you should be doing this, and you should be doing that. When they encounter you living happy and lightly and freely, that's an attractive thing. I think that attracts people more than that sourpuss kind of serious, you know, dour, no fun in life kind of a <laughs> Christian. The, the traditional, you know, image that we have, which I think is incorrect. And um, I love that picture that... Uh, Charlie, remember you got a bunch of those pictures of Jesus laughing? Uh, I have one framed back there, so if you haven't ever seen it, be sure to take a look at that. Do you still have those around anywhere? Yeah. You still got some? Yeah. That's wonderful. I think that is a, that's, the, that's the way we should visual it. Jesus is not a dour. I don't think he's a dour, sour, uh, you know, sourpuss. <laughs> I, think, I think he had joy in his life, and I think he lived this way, freely and lightly. I think that's why... Uh, the Gospels tell us that the sinners and the publicans and all the down and outers, they like to gather around him. They like to be with him. You know, the Pharisees didn't like it. They were the sourpuss, dour, you know, pickled uh, <laughs> individuals. Uh, they were mad, you know. Uh, the text of, of one chapter says they were angry because uh, that he, uh, he, he met with sinners and ate with them. <laughs> Well, we say ate with them. You know what was happening was it was, it was like a, what we would call a party going on. Because when he told parables to describe the situation, he gave one that we call the prodigal son. And at the end of it, the sourpuss brother who doesn't like the fact that the, the son who had done things wrong is now accepted. He said it came near the house and there was partying. And he heard laughter and, and music and partying. See, I think what was going on, Jesus would meet with them and... They were having a good time. They were laughing, I think, and having, having fellowship and, and joy, and that made the Pharisees, it drove them crazy. <laughs> they didn't see it that way. Anyway, I think this is true here. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. And he that began the good work in you, he's taken it on himself to get the job done. See, what I think is great about this, we've entered into something that's way bigger than we understand. It's a big, big thing. And uh, he knows what he's doing. Okay, let's all stand up today.